You're on a beach. You're sitting in a lifeguard chair. You are a lifeguard. And all of a sudden, you notice that someone deep in the sea is getting into trouble. Now stop. Of course, in reality, you should start running, but I want you to stop at this point and appreciate one of the difficult problems that a lifeguard needs to solve at this point. The lifeguard needs to ask him or herself, what path should I follow? Should I run directly to the person in the water? Or should I follow a different path? The problem that this lifeguard needs to solve is a problem of least time. You want to go from point A to point B from your lifeguard chair to the person in need, and you want to take the path that minimizes the overall time. And given the fact that you can run faster on the beach than you can swim in the sea, the path that you should follow is not the straight one, but you should attack the sea at a certain angle. This is a famous metaphor, originally coined by Feynman, to illustrate one of the most intriguing aspects of light. When light is traveling from point A to point B, it will always choose the path that minimizes the overall time. I'm sure all of you are familiar with these types of experiments where light is actually hitting an interface between two materials with a different refractive index. Now, the refractive index of a material is a parameter that determines how fast light can travel through that material. And because of the fact that light wants to minimize the overall time to go from point A to point B, it will always refract when it goes from one refractive index to another one. You could say that light is a perfect lifeguard. The fact that light is behaving the way it does in this peculiar way is actually already known for several centuries, even before we knew what light is actually, what actually is. It was Pierre de Fermat who summarized the principle of Fermat. Back in those days, you could give your own name to those principles. And that principle was stating that light is going from point A to point B in a minimal time. And because of this principle, we can understand a lot of peculiar behavior that light is actually following when it is traveling through, for instance, media with a smoothly varying refractive index profile. I'm sure most of you have seen this before. For instance, above the hot sand in the desert, where the refractive index of the air is slightly lower, close to the ground, than high up in the air. And as a result, a light beam, a light ray that is emanating from a palm tree or from the blue sky towards us as observers is following a curved path, glazing past the sand. With our brains and our eyes, we are not aware of the fact that it was following this path, and therefore we reconstruct the image of the blue sky or, of the, or the palm tree somewhere at a location where the palm tree is not located. This is the origin of many optical illusions, Fata Morgana's mirages. But a very, very similar type of light bending is appearing in a completely different space, in outer space. Within the context of general relativity, Einstein generalized the laws of gravity by stating that the presence of large masses or energy can deform the background of space-time. And light, when it's traveling from one point to another point, will follow this deformation of the space-time, will follow the curvature of space-time. Also, this gives rise to optical illusions. Whenever we see starlight at a certain location, it is perfectly possible that it passed by a large planet or a large other star and was deflected towards us. So we might see the star at a certain location, but in reality, it is at a different location. What I want you to notice is that light behavior in these two different types of spaces is quite equivalent. On the one hand, we have light propagating within the context of general relativity on the background of a curved space-time. On the other hand, we have light propagation through a material with a spatially varying refractive index profile within the context of classical optics. Well, now, 10 years ago, two scientists, Professor John Pendry, Professor Ulf Leonhardt, they realized that this equivalence goes beyond the qualitative picture that I'm describing you now. 
This goes up to the level of the most fundamental equations in optics. For those of you who came here today to see some hardcore mathematics, and I know you're out there, <laughs> this is when it's happening. I'm not going to describe the equations in detail, but I think it's, it's pleasant to see them once in a while. These are Maxwell's equations. These are the equations describing how light is behaving in a certain material, a material that is characterized by a refractive index, by material parameters. I'm not looking at them in detail, but I want to, s to show you what happens when we rewrite these Maxwell's equations on the background of a curved coordinate system within the context, for instance, of general relativity. What happens is the following. They look even more complicated, don't they? Now there is a new parameter, the G parameter, that is essentially telling you the curvature of space-time. Now, this obviously went way too fast, but if you put these two sets of equations next to each other and you stare at them a very, very long time, then you start to see that they're actually equivalent. They can be exactly the same set of equations if we assume the following set of bridge equations where on the one hand you have material properties, epsilon and mu, which is something like a refractive index, something that we can make here on Earth. And on the other hand, we have the parameter g, which is a curvature of space-time. These equations allow us to make materials that mimic the behavior of light inside a curved space-time. These are the equations that I worked with for many, many years during my PhD, in which I was investigating what new kinds of applications become possible when you start using general relativity in the design of optical components. When I started my PhD, there was already a pretty famous application out there. Scientists had demonstrated that you can make an all new sort kind of uh, optical component that can make things invisible, the so-called cloak of invisibility. But for me to explain you how invisibility works, I think I first have to explain you how visibility works. So let's have a closer look at this bowler head. Why is this bowler head visible to you? The answer is easy. There's a lot of light here. There's the light sources, there's the lamps that are illuminating the bowler head with light rays. When these light rays are arriving at the bowler head, they're being reflected and scattered in all possible directions. And I think it's important to think for a moment about the fact that these light rays are all containing the visual information of this bowler head. The color, the geometry, the position, all of it is in there. And when these light rays are arriving at your eyes, our brain is capable to reconstruct the image of the bowler head. This is how visibility works. Sometimes I'm more excited about visibility than invisibility. But in order for us to make this invisible, we need to do two things. First of all, we need to make sure that none of the light rays are reflecting on the bowler head. That's an easy thing to do. But way more complicated is the fact that we need to make sure that all the light rays are being bent around the bowler head because that way we can make sure that the information of the light rays stays contained and you can retrieve the information of what is hidden behind the bowler head. And therefore we can see, for instance, the sun. Now I can assure you that within the context of classical optics, 15 years ago, if you would have asked someone, can you make me a cloak of invisibility that does exactly this? They would have told you, no, this is simply an unsolvable problem. But within the context, of this equivalence between general relativity on the one hand and optics on the other hand, this becomes quite a solvable problem. One simply needs to think of a certain distribution of coordinates, a certain stretching of the space-time that bends all the coordinate lines around a certain inner region. And then we use the equivalence relation to make materials that have exactly the refractive index that is needed to implement this in a real-life component. A problem that is unsolvable can be solved in just a few minutes. But wait a minute. Now we know what kind of refractive index we need, but where, where do we find this refractive index? This is where nanotechnology kicks in. Because 
Oddly enough, we, never, we can't find any materials here on Earth that have exactly the refractive index that you need to make something invisible. But we can make our own materials using nanotechnology. Artificial composite materials can have a refractive index that is determined by very, very small building blocks. They are engineered in such a way that we can make any type of refractive index, or at least many more than we have seen so far. And so the combination of these two things, general relativity and optics on the one hand, and then advanced nanotechnology on the other hand, allows us to make all so new sorts of optical components, including invisibility cloaks. And this has been done over the last decade. Many research teams have been developing invisibility cloaks. I didn't take any with me, so I guess you know that they don't exist on a macroscopic scale. But there are a lot of experimental verifications of invisibility cloaks that do make something invisible. Unfortunately, they are so small that they make something invisible that is already invisible for the naked eye. <laughs> but I'm, I'm very confident a lot of scientists are working on this. This is a technological problem that a lot of scientists are tackling right now. They are making invisibility cloaks, and they're scaling them up at microscopic levels. But honestly, if you ask me, the main result of this research line is probably not the development of invisibility cloaks. I'm personally most excited about the fact that this algorithm where you're rewriting your equations within the context of general relativity to manipulate these waves is actually allowing us to manipulate all sorts of waves, including water waves. We can now make cloaks for water waves to shield critical islands from very strong waves. Same thing can be said about seismic waves. We can cloak certain skyscrapers by manipulating the distribution of the ground underneath them, such that earthquakes are guided around them. What about sound waves? Yes, also here, you just manipulate the equations using Einstein's general relativity, reinterpret them, and with some advanced nanotechnology, you can indeed uh, make new components that guide sound in unprecedented ways. Over the last decade, most fields in applied physics have benefited from exactly this procedure, where you're applying the tools from Einstein's general relativity in combination with some advanced material science to start solving unsolvable problems. So I guess this is my take-home message for you. Next time you're facing an unsolvable problem, try to approach it from a new perspective. Try to deliberately use the tools and the language from another discipline. Perhaps you might find your problem becomes invisible. Thank you. <laughs>